I just wanted to tell you a story um, from back at school. My mum always used to pack, sell, you know, healthy sandwiches, you know, meat and salads and, and all this kind of stuff. But my friends got like canteen food. So I blame my mum because I became like a canteen scab. You know, you got, you got five cents? You got five cents? You get, if you get enough five senses, you get a meat pie, right? So, um, but it's good because if you, if you get enough of the five senses, you get the meat pie, but you also get the reputation, don't you, for being the canteen scab. So that was a bit of a challenge. And I think sometimes it's, it's easy to feel like that um, with fundraising, isn't it? You just like the kind of the, the scab, always got your hand out looking for, for money and it's hard to kind of just get over the awkwardness of, of, um, of scabbing. Um, now, fundraising, learning how to do fundraising has been a very steep learning curve for me because um, when we looked at setting up a budget for the first year of the church plant at Foster, the budget turned out to be like slightly over $100,000 for myself and a MTS, Esther and all the equipment and all the, all the start-up operational costs. And I was just thinking, that, I've never even poked a stick at that much money in my life. Where on earth are they going to come from? And so I went and chatted to, um, you know, a, a guy who'd planted a church and it had gone well. And I said, how do, how do you do fundraising? And he basically said he, uh, what Rod had shared in the previous session, that uh, the pastor is the primary person responsible for raising the finances. And this was the, uh, this was the um, training and advice I got. The money's out there. Go get it. <laughs> so that's it. That's all I got for you. Uh, <laughs> That's no, the, the money is out there, go get it. And, and I thought that is very unhelpful. Um, yet that was exactly what I needed to hear uh, just to go and to have to own it, to go and work it out, have to sort it out. So, like I said, the, the learning curve's been um, pretty, pretty steep. And I remember um, being driven to prayer big time because I, I was really nervous and scary. And um, he, he's, um, he, he was my experience. I'm thinking. And I've got a four-week-old baby. I'm quitting my job. I'm selling my house. I'm moving to a town where we don't know anyone, where employment, where finding employment is a challenge. We're starting the church with full, two full-time uh, employees, myself and someone on, on MTS. We're going there with a core group of five unemployed people. Uh, the first year budget's about 110 grand. Where is that going to come from? I mean, even if we survive the first year, how are we going to be self-funded after three years, which was our, our, hope, our hope? You know, humanly speaking, it goes something like this. Let's move up the coast and ask strangers to give us over $100,000 a year each year after three years. Like that, that is nuts, isn't it? Hey, stranger. <laughs> Show us the money. It's, it's a very strange plan, but... Our God's big enough for that, isn't he? The gospel was glorious enough for that. That's why we felt like we could um, head north, pray like crazy, Lord, please fund the mission. And I can tell you, mate, after seven years, God has funded um, every year uh, in surplus to what we've needed. We got like money saved in the account. It's like it, it blows my mind how uh, abundantly God has been able to provide. We're not, um, we're not 100% self-funded yet. It's currently about 70%. Um, but God has been gathering people to himself, growing his church, and growing the people in the church in their generosity. Um, now, we, uh, we, we would ideally like to be self-funded as you know, now. Um, there's some challenges for where we live. Foster's fairly low socioeconomic area, a bunch of retirees, not much employment, very seasonal work with, with the kind of tourist nature of our town. So I still have to work very hard at fundraising, not just inside the church, but, but outside. So that's kind of the backstory and my, my context. But the first practical thing, I think, in terms of the senior minister as the chief resource raiser is, you know, own it and pray. Trust, just honestly pray, trusting that God can resource uh, the mission. Uh, the other thing is, if that really is your responsibility, actually have to put it in your job description. You can't kind of do it on the side. It needs to be part of your job. It needs time. It needs planning. And for the first three years, and even before we moved up there, I was giving it half a day a week or more 
to, to fundraising? Or was this actually a key part of my role? So don't think you can kind of somehow tack it on. It's actually got to be part of your job description and you've got to give it the time that it needs. And also, if you're the primary fundraiser, you need to be modelling, um, modelling your own um, conviction about this being strategic for the gospel and your own um, generosity um, and setting an example for those who are, who are partnering with you. I think one of Rod's other principles was that um, money follows a credible shared vision. And this is really key, isn't it? If you're the leader, you've got you to be personally convicted about exactly what it is you're trying to achieve and, and enthuse others to join you with in achieving and seek and resource for. Unless you're, unless you're clear about what you're trying to achieve, you're not going to be able to articulate that to anyone. And, and why would anyone want to throw money at a vague weird plan if there's no strategy to get it done. So keep working again at, at being clear about the vision uh, of the ministry and how it's going to get done. Because if you're not clear about it, you're not going to inspire confidence in that. Now I can tell you Coastly Sea's vision um, is that we want to see as many of the 25,000 people who live in a 25 minute drive of Foster are connected to Jesus as possible. We're going to give them opportunity to hear the gospel. We want to set up like a planting hub in Foster that can then plant into the, the satellite suburbs surrounding that so they can meet Jesus. And then we also want to plant in Taree, which will become a hub for planting into those suburbs. That's, that's, our, that's our big dream. That's what we want to see happen. Um, and that's what we call people to partner with us in. So, so kind of work out, work out the particular vision that you're going to call people to and work out how to articulate it in a fairly... Um, inspiring way and we also had um, we had kind of goals for our finances like I was saying we, we wanted to be self-funded we were very aware that we'd been generously supported by a lot of other churches but um, we didn't want to be the Centrelink church forever we wanted to be a generous church to others um, as well and practically speaking if you're gonna if you're gonna become self-funded you have to work out where the money that's coming in is coming from so practically speaking, if your goal is to be self-funded, you actually need to track um, where, the, where the money's coming from. So we, we ask people to either let us know if they're giving as a supporter or as a, as a member of church. Are they from outside the church or inside? So we can actually get the books out there and go, here's how much has come from outside, here's how much has come from inside, so we can track progress on that. If that is a goal, you've got to work out how to track progress toward the goal. And also, if, if your goal, your other financial goal is to be a generous uh, a generous church in supporting others, you need to work out how to weave that into the, the budget um, as well. So right from the start, we wanted to be committed to uh, seeing a, a, a church planting movement in Australia grow. So even though we weren't self-funded by a long shot at the start, we gave a portion of the, the giving from the, the locals to um, like Mackay Evangelical Church, they got like the biggest, the biggest chunk. And then we gave uh, another chunk to the, the network of churches we're part of, the FIC, and then another chunk to Geneva um, to fund a broader work. So for us, that looked like 7%, so kind of 4% to Mackay, 2% to FIC, and 1% uh, to Geneva. And, and we, we're seeking to, under God, grow in our generosity to get over 10% to, to give away. Um, so, in terms of not just having a vision for where you want to, um, you know, how you want to grow God's kingdom, but you need some kind of vision for your own financial goals and work out practically how to weave them into your budget and track them. One of Rod's other principles was um, money is a heart issue. It's about raising faith, not so much funds. So this is this is really challenging, isn't it? Without feeling like the scab always talking about money, asking for money. But um, it's, it's a weird, money's a weird thing in our culture because it's a little bit of a taboo thing um, to talk to people personally about. Like if, if I was to just sit down with um, just a random person in your, in your church and just say, hey, how you going? Um, how much do you earn? Like, well, give us an amount. And, and how much do you give? That's an awkward, con that's a weird, that's weird, right? I, I take it? Yeah, yeah. But why is that? for Christians, like it's only money, um, but it's so weird that we've got to work out how to, how to address the issue. Um, and so uh, preaching on money, very important. We don't, we don't do money preaching series. We, we just teach book by book, but when money comes up, you've got to make sure you, you, you hit it pretty, pretty hard, gently, but firmly. So, so we are 
As often as it comes up in Scripture, we want to hit it. Um, I'm not sure which book I read on this. It was a small one, and it was very helpful. And uh, one, of the, one of the points in terms of fundraising was fundraising is not a necessary evil. It's necessary to combat evil. Um, and the kind of illustration was um, there's a couple of different ways you can try and win a war, right? You can like, try and like, take out all their soldiers. That's the front line battle. Or you can send the SAS in behind the line to try and disrupt the flow of resource and support. Because if you can cut off the, su the, the, the supply going to the front line, there will be no front line. And, and this is part of the strategy that the enemy uses in, in the spiritual battle for souls is to cut off the supply line to the front line, to cut off people's generosity to the gospel so gospel workers can't be funded. And so part of a, a, a spiritual battle strategy is you've got to work out how to get the supply line flowing to fund the soldiers in the front line of the battle. And I, I kind of like that. Like, that sounds like a bit of a fight. <laughs> Like that sounds like that, that's that's captured me. It's part of a spiritual battle. It's not a necessary evil talking about money. It's necessary to combat evil, which is stemming the flow of resources uh, for the gospel. This other this this book also um, went on to talk about how um, asking for money is it, a hard issue because it's actually making a disciple of the other person. They're not just a cash cow. You're trying to milk for for funding, that they're a brother or sister in Christ that you're actually trying to help form as a disciple of Jesus in the process. So when I ask, ask a Christian to put their, their treasure uh, and align that with God's purposes, I'm making a disciple. It's part of disciple making because I'm helping them align their resources, their treasure with God's purpose. So, so it's actually good for the donors. And this was a healthy kind of um, attitude or perspective thing I needed to get that I'm actually doing them a favour. Can I have your money? I'd love to do you a favour, help you become a better disciple of Jesus. That actually was something that helped me become the scab that I am. Um, it's obviously also good for the church because you get uh, resource to reach lost people. It's great for lost people. They get to hear the gospel. It's good for God. He's going to get heaps of glory as disciples are made and new people hear about Jesus. And it will also help shape your church. Um, if you've been a church that has received generosity... You will want to be a church, I take it, that wants to give generously. So it sows something in, in the culture of the church as well. It might, might sound counterintuitive, that one, being the asking for um, money church. Because you go, mate, people have given so generously to us. Of course we're going to give generously to others. So some more good news in terms of the, the, the fundraiser business is God owns everything. It's a helpful reminder, isn't it? God owns everything, and he's very generous. He's, um, he's more keen to see church plants and church, church growth than you are. Um, and God's people are very keen to give. I don't know if you know, God's people are keen to give. Don't think that, you know, being a pastor makes you, like, somehow a more keen Christian than others. Other Christians have different responsibilities. They might not have the gifts or time, but they're, they're as keen to see the kingdom advance as you are. They're keen to give. Sometimes they just need the opportunity to give. So um, um, I remember the, the first time that I met um, a bunch of the pastors in the network I'm part of, the FIAC. I was living at Collaroy, and they were having their annual conference at Collaroy, and one of them invited me down there to just kind of Share, share what, um, what, what we're thinking in terms of going to foster. And um, so I just shared the, the plan to move up the coast and have a go at this. And afterwards, three of the, the pastors just came up and said, that sounds great, mate. Can we give you some money? I'm like, totally you can. And someone else said, that's great. We've, we've got a PA that um, we're not using. Would you like to have our PA? I'm like, yeah, totally. And another one said, mate, we'd love to sponsor that too, so let us know what the needs are. They just, for no reason that I could work out, because the plan didn't seem that, cook, that well cooked. Uh, but they wanted to bankroll the mission. And the God's people are keen to give, aren't they? You just see some crazy generous Christians. They're out there. They're out there. Um, and, I, and I think, isn't it weird how some secular community groups try and raise money? I think about my soccer club. They spend so many hours putting on something like a trivia night. And they work so hard, and they end up earning like a couple of hundred bucks for the club, and they're all like, yeah. 
But every week at church, someone will just go, if you'd like to partner with us in the gospel, we'll pass some bags around, feel free to give. We get more than the soccer club, just by one sentence. And why is that? Christians love Jesus. They're keen to give. They're not like, you don't have to squeeze too hard. If they know Jesus, they love Jesus. they're keen to give. So, brothers and sisters, you know, take heart. God's keen to finance the mission. God's people are generous. Keep preaching the gospel. Keep articulating a clear vision. And, and you know, money will come. Because they want to give. They want to give. Um, and one of Rod's other points, ministers must learn how to ask in an appropriate and gracious way. Um, I'm not really that good at the appropriate and gracious um, way sometimes. I'm probably more better at the... Um, the bold and brazen um, approach. Um, that's possibly a personality thing or just a lack of spiritual maturity thing. <laughs> but it gets the job done, people. It gets the job done. <laughs> but I think what, what has enabled me to be bold and brazen really are those foundational things. That this is good for them. I'm making a disciple. It's good for lost people. They're going to hear the gospel. And I'm very happy to go into bat for other people. I don't feel like I'm the scab asking for me because I'm asking on behalf of the lost people. Jesus died for them. I've moved my family up the coast for their sake. So, mate, if I'm prepared to take a a hit for the team, I'm I'm happy to invite anyone else to take the same kind of hit. Um, Now, in terms of um, raising funds, a a very helpful concept I've found is you need to work out the, the different sources of income that you're likely to be able to tap into work out what they are and then how to try and uh, get those, those little streams flowing. If you can get enough little streams flowing, you get a river of, uh, a river of resource. So that's uh, so what we try and do. We sit down, we sat down with the leadership team, we brain, brainstormed every possible source of, of um, funding we could imagine and then tried to work out a strategy for seeing if we could get some flow uh, from that. And that was a very fruitful exercise for our leadership um, team. And I love, I love what Jesus says, you know, he says, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, so Christians have got treasure, right? So fundraising's like a treasure hunt, isn't it? You go find Christians who've got a heart for the gospel, you're like a pirate for the gospel. It's like a treasure hunt. Honestly, identifying income streams and potential donors, it's, mate, get your pirate on. It's, it's beautiful. Um, and, and then working out how to, how to ask. So, so let me give you some examples. We, there's two broad categories for us in terms of income streams. There are internal uh, income streams. They're funded locally by the people in Foster. And then there's external um, sources. So the first internal um, income stream is, is me as the, as the lead guy. Um, there's my personal savings that I can um, give to, to the work. There's the personal sacrifice I can make by taking a pay cut. Um, there's, um, there needs to be a willingness for me to curb my lifestyle. Uh, there's my personal giving, um, which, which I shared before, we, we annually review and work out how to be more generous to the, the local church. And then there's my wife. I can um, ask her to either um, go out and get a job work part-time so we can earn some more money, so we can give some more. But there's, the first one is, is, is me. Um, the, second, the second kind of internal stream is, is our launch team or your core group or those who, who have gone with you or, or who are there on the ground ready. Um, it, it's to kind of, like Rod was saying, is to ask them to give generously and to say what they're, they're going to give. That was, um, that was a big one for us. And we also then asked our core team to um, try and recruit three other financial givers each. So they had to go, if they, if they were going to move up the coast with us, they obviously believed in, in the cause and they would know other Christians who, could, um, who they could say, mate, we're going, can you help support this, this mission? So um, th- that becomes another external, external kind of income source, their mates, but initially it's coming through, through them. Uh, there's obviously then the, uh, the newcomers to church. And uh, so, again, as, as people are coming into the church, they need to be um, familiarised with the vision and invited to partner in that. And you've got to work out a way to um, bring them up to speed on that. And there's some practical, um, 
practical you know issues here so whether you have a weekly collection in, in your gatherings that's obviously a an income stream there or whether you divert that as much as possible to direct deposit because that that generally um, creates a bit more of a steady stream. And then um, also internally, we have specific fundraisers for uh, different different projects where they can give to um, specific ministries or new things we're keen to start up. And this is something we, we have to monitor well because um, you know, you're familiar with the concept of like compassion fatigue. You know, you see too many ads on TV asking for money for World Vision, you just turn it off because it's too depressing, you just get over it. So too many fundraisers, it's just like, here they go, here they go. So we've got to work out what's an appropriate number of fundraisers we can run for projects throughout the year and then guard the airtime so there's not a constant request for, for money. Um, and, and with the fundraisers, uh, Rod, Rod mentioned this too, um, people like to give to a variety of different projects so we give people a variety of, of options uh, from um, in, in our town particularly there's like there's nothing for the youth right nothing for the youth is kind of what everyone believes about the youth in town so whenever we do something for the youth we can always ask for money because everyone wants to see something happen for the youth so um, we know that that's a fairly fairly readily available a thing we can plug. So the youth, are we, they're going to start meeting at the squash court now. That's going to be like $3,000 rent a year. Man, where's that going to come from? We haven't, you know, this is what's going to be asked in the next few Sundays. And someone will say, that's great. Something happening for the youth. I'll give $3,000. So we don't really just have to write it in as a, just a normal budget line expense because it's going it, to, it will come. We also know that um, see, for us seasonally, there's, there's better, better times to do fundraising than others. So my town is a holiday town. So over summer, the town swells to three times as big. We get lots of holiday maker Christians who've probably got their direct debit set up to their church and they don't want to give to the general ongoing costs of the, the church they're visiting. But if they're there, they might go, oh, I mean, I'm on holidays. I've got some vitamin D from all the sun. I'm feeling good. There's a particular project for the youth in the town. Oh, I can chip into that because it's, it's like a, it's a project they can help with rather than operational costs. So, so we try and w work out who's going to be around when and work out how best to frame some of our fundraising campaigns. Um, uh, tax deductible options too also also help. So we have a scripture fund um, uh, set up, and we have a we have a mercy fund. We we call it the love bomb fund at church, where people can give. Um, we kind of just keep the money on the side, and we keep our ear out for people who are, are battling financially, and we um, we try and meet their need as best we can, and we try and drive that through our small groups. We say, if someone in your small group is struggling financially, first step is see if the other group members can meet the need. And if it's beyond the ability of the group member, so we have money, we want to give it away. So like, let us, let us give you some money to, you know, to help the person in your group. Or if people in your group know someone in the community who's doing it tough, let's like, here's some money, go and, go and bless them, because people have given to this fund. And that, that fund is always well stocked we can't actually can't get rid of the money as quick as it comes in because because people mate isn't it great because christians love other people they want to they want to give their money to people in need uh, we also do internal fundraising uh, pushes at our at vision gatherings we have two primary ones each year the, the first one um, is what we call our dream and scheme day we do this in october and um, this is where we say, next year, God willing, here's some of the broad brushstrokes of, of the next big moves we're trying to do. And we, we invite people to say, how can we do what we're doing better? And we try and paint the picture and say, and all of that's going to roughly cost, we think, about X dollars. And so for next year's budget, that's kind of the, the step up we're looking at taking. So it's kind of like the, the groundwork for our, our, um, our AGM which is the next kind of vision. And our AGM is really our vision meeting. We say, here is the plan. In light of the dream and scheme day we had and we prayed about and your feedback, here now is the plan, here now is the budget. Now, will you reconsider what you'll give in this year coming and to what particular project you'd like to support? So there's some internal, internal giving streams. There's, there's you, there's your launch team, there's the other members of the church, and they can give you know, cash or direct deposit or via special fundraisers. 
Um, and we live in an increasingly ageing town, so we're trying to work out how to um, encourage people to do bequests in their will. We haven't really worked out how to have those gracious and appropriate conversations yet. So if you've got tips on that, come and please, uh, please help me out. So that's the internal source. Then there's external kind of uh, funding streams. There's the, the first one is probably a mother church. If you're planting, um, you obviously want to um, ask the mother to like mother you for a while and um, not try and fly the coop too fast. There's other partner churches you may try to recruit. So if you know any other pastor or anyone else in the network, it's worth catching up with them and asking. You can only, you can only ask. Um, and then there's, um, there's other individuals who, who don't come to your church. They're not, they're not churches, they're not mother church, just, just Christians that you know. And I'll tell you what, this probably has been the biggest source of our um, external, external funding is just Christians who want to get on board and, and, and partner. And so a couple, of, a couple of tips for these guys is, is just to ask boldly, be able to articulate that vision clearly, lay out a strategy, um, let them see the, the steel in your, in your spine as you, as you kind of articulate it, that you're willing to sacrifice for it, and then, and then just ask big. Just ask big. Um, particularly if, if you know there are some Christians who God has blessed with the ability to make good money, um, mate, ask big. You, can, you, you do not have because you do not ask. Um, same with, same with donations, you know. Ask big and, and let people say their own no. So we, we say no for other people often, don't we? Oh, we couldn't ask this of them. You've already said no for them. Just ask and at least let them say their own no. Ask small because there's people who are widows and the widow's might counts. It's beautiful to God. There's uni students. There's school kids. Ask small. And ask all. Um, just may anyone, anyone you can think of as a Christian, it's worth a shot. Why not? Um, another, another form of um, external funding that we have tried to uh, raise is um, anyone who's on staff at church is expected to raise a significant portion of their salary from outside the church. And that's because where we live, is not a lot of, there's not a lot of money. So for myself, I set myself the goal for the first five years at, at up the coast to raise 100% of my own funding from outside Foster. And, and, and God has been incredibly gracious, and I've been able to do that, um, which, is, which has been a blessing to the church because it hasn't been a burden on them that they couldn't afford. Um, and now I'm kind of shooting for 30%. Um, and all other staff who come on for the first three years, we expect them to, to ask 30% of their, pa their total package from, their, uh, from other churches, from other Christians, wherever they can find it. And then after three years, we scale it back to 15%, then 7%, then 0% by, by year six. And that's just because of the nature of, of the town that we're living in. So external giving, you've got you know, partner churches, individuals, um, staff donors, and then, and then lastly, uh, grants. So there's, there's several different grants available for various things, um, some for church planting, some for um, MTS training, and some available from the government for particular projects. So work out what, what grants are there and apply. I've applied for heaps of grants that I've been knocked back on, but uh, some I've been successful for. All this takes time, doesn't it? So you've got to weave it into your, into your job description. Um, so how do you identify all these streams? Mate, sit down with your core team, your launch team, your leadership team, brainstorm. Where could, could funds possibly come from? Write them down, then work out how are we going to try and get that stream flowing? Who's going to, who's going to have a crack at that? How are we going to do it? Uh, and work out how, how to ask. Um, personally, I've found that personal conversations have been more productive than um, email outs or letters or, uh, or whatever. So um, you've got to work out how to have, um, have those uh, conversations. And I think that uh, what, what potential partners want to hear, what they want to, want to, what they want to know is that they want to have confidence in you as a leader. They, they want to know that there's some kind of track record or, um, or that there's been some kind of you know, green light from someone else. So you're not like some self-appointed 
rock star, whatever, cult leader, something like that. So um, it's very helpful being part of like the Geneva network because you get assessed and then either recommended as a church planter. And that's a great kind of, um, it's a great thing to be able to kind of, you know, say to people, I've, I've had wise, older Christian Christians assess me and I think I'm suitable. Um, so they need confidence in you as the leader. They need to see that you've, you actually know you have a plan. You don't just have a dream. You know, you've got, you got a plan for kind of making it happen. You've got a reasonable budget that when you, when you talk to them about the costs, um, it's not like um, too stingy because, you know, people with money, they, they're realistic too, but it's not too, um, too over the top. Like if everything in your budget is for like top of the line PA, they're like, nah, you gotta have some garage time first. Uh, you can't kind of shoot for gold, I don't think. People will go, what, why? You know what I'm saying. Um, you need to have a plan, I think, to become self-funded. They don't wanna um, feel like they're gonna, you're gonna be relying on them forever, that there needs to be some exit strategy for, for, for them as a funding source. They need a very clear request from you. Uh, what are you actually asking for? And they need, I think they, they need to know there's going to be a genuine partnership and, and that they're not just a cash cow. You know, that they need to know that there's going to be, um, there's going to be communication, there's going to be uh, updates on how their support's being used. Um, and so practically speaking, we send a supporter update every two months to anyone who's supporting us. Every two months we make sure that goes out with what's been happening and what's coming up. I mean, the first kind of four or five years, we sent out a video um, every kind of three or four months, just a, just a short update. We didn't make them chase content if they're a partner church. And every year, I would call um, the individual donors I'd lined up, honestly, just to do a thank you call. I ring, ring them up in about you know October, November, near the end of the year, say, hey, I'm just ringing up. I just wanted to say thanks. Um, Good on you, I really appreciate your support. And um, I'm ringing up to see if there's anything I can pray for you for. Just because they're friends, they're brothers and sisters. They're not like, they're not just people to milk. They're like, they're partners in the mission. And so um, um, I'm, I'm concerned for them progressing as disciples too. So I wanna, I wanna be in prayer for, for our donors, thanking God for them. And, and lastly, I think they wanna see that there's some progress being made so that the, the investment's a decent one for them. And so any opportunity you get to tell a story um, that kind of reinforces that the that, that kind of vision is moving forward is helpful. Um, you need to make it easy to give. Um, and honestly, we um, foolishly started fundraising for um, going up the coast before we had a bank account set up. And that just got, you know, a little bit messy and weird and was kind of pledges here and some was going via different church accounts and it didn't really have anywhere to land and I, I foolishly set up the bank account in um, it, it, the Narrabeen branch where I used to live before I went to Foster so then there's all these kind of anyway make it easy to give by having having the groundwork done before you ask for money you know have somewhere for the funds to go have very clear um, bank details on anything that you give to people that's asking for money. Um, make it very easy with a click. Click this link now and it will take you to the page to give. Just make it easy. Make it easy for them to give as best you can. Um, I think I might just pull, I might just pull a pin there, Scotty, if that's all right. That's it.